what it feels like. And this is what it feels like. And this is what it feels like. This is what it feels like. Hey family, welcome to a very special live edition of the Carlos Watson Show. Today on the eve of the holiday itself, we're commemorating, celebrating, breaking down all things Juneteenth. And as luck would have it, timing couldn't be better. Just over 24 hours ago, President Biden signed into law a bill officially making Juneteenth at long last a national holiday. Joining us today is an all-star lineup of celebrities, academics, comedians, journalists, thought leaders, and more to discuss the history of Juneteenth, the year that was, and the immediate path ahead. We're calling this the journey to Juneteenth, and it's brought to you in collaboration with our very good friends at Procter & Gamble, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Chevrolet. Thanks again to all of them and to all of you for being here today and joining the conversation. In fact, you can join the conversation by using the hashtag journey to Juneteenth across all your social media handles. All right, let's get into it. Our first conversation is centered around the simple yet profound question. What exactly is Juneteenth? Take a look at this. Juneteenth is June 17th, right? Juneteenth is on June 19th. Um, it is a holiday. Juneteenth is Liberation Day. Like, for real, for real. Uh, I think it's June 15th. I'm not, yeah, I'm not, that piece I'm, I'm not a little, I'm not totally sure about. African American people really see this as sort of their true Independence Day. Juneteenth is considered Independence Day for Black Americans. It's the blending of June and 19th and celebrates the day slavery ended in America. After the Civil War ended and President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, enslaved people were officially declared free. But there were still black people who hadn't heard the news. It would take more than two years for enslaved people in Texas to finally learn that they were free. The day that happened was June 19, 1865. Today, black people celebrate June 19th much like the 4th of July with parades, picnics, and family gatherings. Celebrations continue to grow around the country. Juneteenth is not only about rejoicing, it's also about reflecting while looking forward to the future. To the American people, thank you for turning out in record numbers to make your voices heard. Here to kick off the conversation are a trio of incredible guests that we're very happy to be welcome to the program. We've got renowned chef and motivational speaker Carla Hall, perhaps best known for her role as the co-host of The Chew. Also joining us today is Mariah Campbell, a terrific Gen Z journalist whose work covering the Juneteenth holiday was recently featured in Cosmopolitan magazine. And finally, Jarvis Givens, Harvard professor of African American studies. Welcome all of you to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So good to see all these faces, and uh, happy Friday to you. Early happy Juneteenth. Um, Jarvis, I'm going to start with you. For folks who you saw that in the, um, in the early package we had, not everyone knows what Juneteenth is. Uh, we did a little bit of that in the package, but how do you explain it to friends, family, colleagues, neighbors, people you bump into who may be trying to get their head around Juneteenth? What do you say? What's your 30-second uh, Juneteenth description? <laughs> right. Um, well, so June 19, 1865 was the day that General Gordon Granger issued what we know as General Orders Number 3 from Galveston, Texas. Um, and this was on behalf of the Union Army. His orders essentially enforced the Emancipation Proclamation, which, as we know, was issued by Abraham Lincoln two and a half years prior. Um, so the date, June 19, 1865, is it's commemorating the kind of enforcement of the Emancipation um, Proclamation in Texas because we know that there continued to be resistance in the Confederate states even after the initial issuing of the Emancipation Proclamation. But essentially, that date is the date that Black folks kind of took up as their own as the day to commemorate um, their transition from slavery to freedom. Um, and, and one of the things that I always say that it's important to know that it wasn't kind of instant magic, right? You can imagine that there continued to be resistance on the part of slave owners. Um, even after June 19th. Um, but, but nonetheless, that's the date that really came to commemorate uh, the end of slavery, particularly in Texas, 
And many of the Black folks from Texas who went other places during the Great Migration took those ceremonies with them. And so, in, for instance, I'm from California, but I learned of Juneteenth through uh, school friends who were from Texas who told me about this holiday um, because they brought those memories and those rituals with them. Well, if you're going to keep calling Texas out like that, I got to go to Mariah, uh, okay. proud graduate of Texas Southern. Um, Mariah, did you grow up knowing much about uh, Juneteenth? And if so, how did you celebrate it, if at all? Well, actually, um, having been raised, born and raised in Texas, um, it's interesting that our education system really suppressed the truths about Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. I didn't learn about I We actually celebrated it in my hometown of Longview, Texas, uh, with a parade, but nobody was there to explain what Juneteenth was or why we were out there barbecuing. We were just out there having a good time. And so when I finally got to Texas Southern, I actually learned about the truths about Juneteenth. Uh, and that really inspired me. And I thought, why is it that we haven't learned about uh, this significant holiday? Day and why is it not celebrated like we celebrate July 4th? Uh, because it's so important to the Black community and just the uh, American society in whole. And Carla, what about you? Uh, where did you grow up? And did you grow up uh, commemorating or somehow celebrating Juneteenth? Or like a lot of people, are you coming to it more recently? I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, but I live in Washington, D.C. So I've been in D.C. since... Um, back in DC since 90, 91. And there are several events that happen in DC uh, for the last, if I remember, like the last eight years or so, eight to 10 years, there's always a number of events and, and they were becoming more and more over the last few years. So for me, and I remember being on the chew, I'm like, hey, why don't we um, do something for Juneteenth? It has taken seven years for me talking about it, I'm on television and I'm the black person <laughs> in the group <laughs> to talk about Juneteenth and it's always been an afterthought. And I would say, pitch the show, um, like even on GMA, hey, let's do something for Juneteenth. Like what, what is it? And um, well, how about if we do it the day before, you know, the 19th, I'm like, no. Um, so it, it has been um, a function of using my voice to try to, you know, um, have people recognize this holiday. So this is such a celebration and I'm so glad that you're doing this. And the fact that, you know, it's now a national holiday and that we're all here makes it even more special. Well, you know, I, I think you're right. And it's interesting, Carla, as I hear you say that because I think a variety of things from uh, Tulsa to uh, Juneteenth to, uh, Kwanzaa, I think were sometimes met with blank stares uh, by friends uh, when you said them. And so part of what I'm hearing you say, Mariah, part of what I'm hearing you say is that at its best, this may be the beginning of a larger, you know, fresh history conversation. Um, and there may be a lot of learning uh, that could just get started with the commemoration, but, but could continue from here. Jarvis, uh, speaking of learning, uh, professor that you are, what else would you love uh, the class that is the United States of America population to learn? What else would you want them to know? If people, if you did finally have people's attention, as Carla said, after seven years or candidly after 150 years, you know, what, what else would you love for people to know if they were leaning in, if they were paying attention, if they were saying, you know what, I'd missed it earlier, but Jarvis, tell me a little bit more. What else do you wish I, I knew? Yeah, well, one of the things that I always enjoy speaking about when it comes to Juneteenth is that um, Juneteenth was not the first Freedom Day celebration that African-Americans celebrated in the United States. It's actually a part of a much longer um, set of commemorative practices. For instance, uh, we have examples and cases of Black people in the U.S. celebrating annually the um, you know, Haitian uh, emancipation, the independence of Haiti, right, that happened in 1804. We see examples of this happening on an annual basis in places like Boston and other parts in the Northeast, even as slavery still existed in the U.S. But then even more important, um, January 1st, 1808, uh, which, commit, which marked the end of the international slave trade in the United States. This didn't mean that slavery ended, but that was the date that it became, um, that, that trading slaves and purchasing slaves internationally um, was outlawed, right? And so we see in places like Philadelphia in New York, um, Black folks gathering on January 1st after 1808 to commemorate the end of the U.S. international slave trade, 
um, but also to, and to celebrate this aspiration of freedom and hoping that this was moving closer toward the complete abolition of slavery in the United States. Um, and so I would say that Juneteenth is a part of this much longer set of political holidays that Black folks have been practicing even before the Civil War. But then there's also an interesting international component to this as well. Um, you know, it was news to me when I was a student at the Black Europe Summer School in Amsterdam in July of 2015, and there was the Keti Koti celebration that happens annually um, in the Netherlands, which is commemorating the end of slavery. Um, and I should say Keti Koti translates to broken chains, um, but it's commemorating the independence and um, the, um, the emancipation of slaves um, on the, in the Dutch colony of Suriname, right? Mm -hmm. So Juneteenth in the US is a part of this much broader narrative about slavery and black folks, uh, their efforts of resistance, right? But also their commemoration of emancipation because we know slavery was not just something that happened in the US. It was something that was much broader than that. And these Freedom Day celebrations are part of black people's political um, participation in civic culture before the Civil War, and it even exceeds the United States. That's one thing that I always think it's important to kind of share, um, to place this in a global context. You know, Jarvis, I love all of that. And Mariah, I'm jealous. I, I wish I was your age. I know it looks like we're the same age, but we're not. I wish I was your age because I, I, I think about the way in which you and your peers are gonna change this world. And I can imagine showing up and being with you in 40, 50 years and seeing a different set of holidays which reflect a larger learning. And I could, I could imagine showing up in 40 or 50 years and meeting your kids and that they've got a different set of statues and the kind of schools they go to have different names. And I can imagine this whole um, um, reset process uh, that might allow us to kind of better integrate the kind of history that Jarvis is talking about. But, but Mariah, let me ask you, um, when you talk to young friends uh, who may be in college, et cetera, how important is Juneteenth? Is it not yet important yet? Are people's minds elsewhere? Or give me a sense of how much of a conversation, at least in your peer set, and again, I know you've written about this for Cosmopolitan and others, but how much conversation among you know teens and 20-somethings is there about Juneteenth? Well, I, I, first I want to say I love that you said that uh, we're kind of in a transition period where things are really taking place, changes are being made, and I'll be honest and say that Gen Z is not letting up. <laughs> <laughs> so the conversations that we're having on my campus as well as amongst my peers is um, how can we push the needle? How can we change the narrative and actually um, show people the importance of Juneteenth? Uh, because we see in our age group, I'm not even, I'm 21 years old, and I can remember at 10, nobody was teaching that in school. And so we see the problem and how this holiday has been suppressed for so many years. Um, and we see that we want to change that. So I think the conversations that we're really having is how can we push the needle and um, make changes and be able to make a difference so that, like you said, our kids can um, experience these things in these different holidays. And, and Carla, talk a little bit, if you would, um, about other things that may be related to Juneteenth that that maybe in a different world, you'd love for other people to become aware of, you'd love for them to consider, you'd love for them to allow it to become part of the larger national culture and conversation. Are there things um, in addition to Juneteenth that you wish were uh, a more central part of the American fabric? <clears throat> well, I think that when it comes to food, and understanding our food. And, and I thought about this when Jarvis was saying, you know, slavery happened in so many places. I mean, only 5% of the slaves or the enslaved came to the US. So that means 95% went somewhere else. I mean, we kept it going, but um, I would like to have a bigger conversation about how our food plays into our culture. I think that when you think about Juneteenth and people start asking you, oh, let's have some historically correct, what are the historically correct dishes to have? And I'm like, and I'm sure Jarvis would, Jarvis, I don't want to put any words into your mouth, but I'm sure you would say, <laughs> um, People were looking for their loved ones. What are you going to do? Just leave a place where you've been living and say, hey, yeah, I'm going to start celebrating. And I think that 
it, it becomes a conversation about our culture. It becomes a conversation uh, like Black Lives Matter. Can everybody celebrate this holiday? Because we should all be celebrating the independence of every single person. And then when you think about um, Juneteenth, you think, hey, was that one of the, I mean, I know that there are all these other freedom um, celebrations. Was that one of the Black Lives Matter? We're not, no one's free unless we're all free, right? So I would like to have a bigger conversation and really think about the impact of this day as a celebration as we start to learn each other's cultures, because the more that our cultures are actually um, on a platform of uh, like large networks and you know mainstream and not niche and and smaller, then people will get to know us. Why do we know other cultures? Because we have seen them repeatedly as we've been growing up. Carla, let's talk a little bit more about food because I've had a number of friends tell me that, that uh, Marcus Samuelson, who I'm sure is a colleague and friend of yours, and Padma Lakshmi and Eddie Wong and others, have told me so often about how food is not just a path to friendship, but a path to learning and understanding and exchange. Talk to me a little bit about how food may or may not play a role in helping people think about um, race uh, more broadly and more effectively. Well, I think that, you know, and people become very uncomfortable with color. It's like, if you don't see my color, see my culture. I think that when you can sit down at a table and talk about the, um, the ingredients that have come um, from West Africa to the United States, black eyed peas, okra, um, how we use um, yams here. And they were, I mean, sweet potatoes here, they were yams there, right? Um, hot water cornbread that I think of, maybe that was uh, fufu um, in Nigeria, uh, corn here that was here. All of those things that connect, we actually can connect the dots when you think about how food traveled. And food, I mean, it's how we, our, um, how we uh, influenced food. I mean, you think of macaroni and cheese, like, oh, the black community is like, yeah, macaroni and cheese. I'm like, most of us are lactose intolerant. So we had to have had been influenced from other cultures, right? So, I mean, there's so much to talk about if we can just one, give each other a pass and say, everybody doesn't know everything. I mean, we talk about red, um, red drinks and everything. We talk about watermelon and, and I know some black people who will not eat watermelon in public, but um, when, when there was an emancipation, People were black people were growing watermelons and and strawberries for financial freedom or a job. And Jarvis, I mean, not that I'm asking the questions, but if you could speak to this, I would love to get your <laughs> your uh, input on it in terms of the financial freedom and how it was, and and why that turn happened with with watermelon and the caricatures and all of that. That was like, um, you know. Um, like fake, the, or fake news back in the day. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Jarvis, give us that, uh, but make it quick, only because I want to make sure we get Mariah before we're done. But also, tell me where things went from 1865. Meaning, uh, talk a little bit about that period, because I know I grew up hearing a lot about Reconstruction. And so I heard not only some of the good news and some of the hopefulness, but, but some of the dissipation of that. And so... Could you give me a minute on that? And I know that's a lot to get to, to go from watermelon to, uh, to the Senate, but, 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 but do that for me if you can. Yeah, well, I can't speak to the specific, you know, context of the food history around, uh, you know, watermelon and things like that. But what I did hear um, in Carla's comment had to do with the economic uh, precarity that Black folks were in after the Civil War, after emancipation, after Juneteenth, if you will, right? Because we know that the, peer, the transition from slavery to freedom is not just this linear narrative that one day you were enslaved, the next day you're able to live full, free and equal lives, right? Black folks were having to figure out the, as best they could how to kind of create opportunities for themselves to uh, create institutions, to build schools, right? One of the things that we know is that despite their lack of material resources, one of the very first things enslaved people, form, formerly enslaved people did was to build schools, right? Um, we, we only have, public education in the South because formerly enslaved people during the period of reconstruction, right, created the legislation and these and, and led the campaigns 
to make universal education accessible in the Southern states, right? So we have public education in the South because of those formerly enslaved people who valued education and who were looking for opportunities for upward mobility and to kind of make lives for themselves to live um, dignified and respectable lives as people, right? But we know that after the period of reconstruction, right, uh, there continued, there was this backlash, right? These efforts to gut all of the progress that black people had made. Du Bois, uh, W.B. Du Bois has a quote where he says, the slave went free, stood a brief moment in the sun, then moved back again towards slavery. Because after the reconstruction period, you have all of these efforts to disenfranchise black people, black folks lost, lost the vote, right? We know about the rise of the, of the Ku Klux Klan. We know about the massive burnings of black schools, right? And so it's very important to know that the story of African-American history after Juneteenth and after the you know, emancipation is a story of black struggle, progress, but then continued retrenchment, continued backlash, right? And, and this is one of the things that I wanted to point to when you were talking about, you know, the now that we have Juneteenth as a national holiday. This is happening at a moment when we see legislative campaigns across so many states to restrict how we teach about race and how we teach about the history of slavery in schools, right? Even as we have Juneteenth now being recognized as a national holiday. That, the, the juxtaposition of these two things is very reflective of the kind of paradox and riddled nature of Black life after emancipation, right? So that's one of the things that I think is important and why Juneteenth ce celebrations always continue to be important because they forced us to remember slavery and continue to think about the ways that slavery continued to structure the racial dynamics of the society that we lived in and that freedom continued to be an unfinished project, essentially. Uh, Jarvis, I love that uh, connection and I love that point. I hate that it's true. I hate that people are uh, in the midst of trying to uh, restrict uh, proper learning and proper education and proper uh, history, but I appreciate you you adding that parallel, Maria. Mariah, I'm going to let you bring us home because I'm starting to, as I look at you, I'm starting to think, is Juneteenth the first Gen Z holiday we have? And is this, again, just the beginning of what may be the kind of work, Carla, that you and I and other people we know have thought about, but actually, you know, Mariah, you said you guys aren't going to let up. So as we close out, what do you think are some of the things that Gen Z is not going to let up about? Who knows whether or not we all will be successful, not just Gen Z, but all of us. We all have a responsibility. But when you said you think that Gen Z is not going to let up, what do you think are some of the issues that you hope that Gen Z will tackle and, and focus, if not themselves on, then maybe the entire country? Right. Um, I, we're living in a very progressive time and, I, and generation, generation Z is a very progressive generation. Um, you can see things like on Twitter talking about Black Lives Matter, the LGBTQ community. There are so many things that are taking place, so many movements of injustice and inequality, Asian hate, um, just really pinpointing and actually bring, shining light on the injustices that have been taking place for centuries in this country. And I think that's something that's very important, not just for us, but for our children, so that we can create together a better America that we can be proud of and that we can uh, say that we belong here and not just live out the uh, words in the Constitution that all men are created equal. That, well, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, we can actually truly live out the words in the, in the Constitution that all men are created equal. Um, and I think, like I said, Gen Z is not letting up and they're holding pretty much everybody accountable, even uh, as Jarvis was speaking about Juneteenth and how it is really a bittersweet thing in retrospect because it's like uh, we were emancipated, we were free, but was it really free? Um, so we're still continuing to push the needle um, and really just try to find ways to progress as a society. Um, I, I hate to do is I got to bring this uh, section to conclusion, but you got us off to such a great start. Uh, but here's how I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to ask each of you for a recommendation for the audience. It can be a book. Uh, it can be a podcast. It could be a movie. It could be a TV show. It could be a magazine. But people who want to uh, continue in this journey of seeing the world and our history more fully uh, and more thoughtfully, point them towards something. Carla, what would you love to, uh, to, to share with people? Is there a a, a podcast, a book, a, a movie, a TV show that has made an impression on you and that other people might enjoy? Um, Natalie Priscilla, we are each other's harvest. Nice one. Very nice one. Uh, Jarvis, what about you? Is there a, uh, a podcast, a movie, a, a, a book, a magazine piece? 
Well, I, I think given that we're here discussing Juneteenth, I think it makes uh, perfect sense to hold up the new book by Annette Gordon-Reed, which is called, entitled On Juneteenth, <laughs> um, because it's an opportunity to continue learning about the holiday, but also learning about um, the very particular history of slavery and Black life in Texas as well. And I think she does a beautiful job in that, in, in, in a memoir fashion, talking about the holiday, but also talking about um, Texas in relationship to African-American history. Mm. Annette Gordon-Reed, who also uh, uh, partnered with Vernon Jordan to write his autobiography. And, and so as we uh, 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 celebrate his life, not his passing, but his life, uh, that's a good one to bring up. Okay, uh, nice one. Mariah, you want to bring us home? Is there a uh, magazine uh, piece or a uh, Twitter feed or a podcast or a film or a book you would uh, you'd point us towards? Well, actually, I have a documentary. It's actually 13th by Ava DuVernay, probably one of my favorite documentaries. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have actually seen it, but I think it really just shines a light on the racism that we're still encountering today. People know a lot about chattel slavery, um, but I think that really shines a light and helps educate people on the systemic racism that's still taking place. Yeah. Uh, thank you to each of you, uh, Carla, Jarvis, Mariah. So nice to see you both. I hope uh, all of you, rather not both, all of you, uh, stay safe and well, and uh, thank you again. Um, all right, if you're just joining us, the Carlos Watson Show has gone live with the Journey to Juneteenth special. And don't worry, you may be a little late to the party, but we've got a ton of good things ahead, including a very lively conversation about the past year and what we can learn from it as we turn to our Juneteenth holiday. Now, I'm going to introduce our next round of guests right after a quick word from our friends at Procter & Gamble. Please take a look. These are the black stories we've been shown again and again. But there's so much more to see. Let's widen the screen so we can widen our view. It's a year most Americans would probably like to forget. We go be all right. We go be all right. 2020 may have been the most consequential year of our lives. A tiny but highly contagious virus called COVID-19 forced the country to shut down. This is a global pandemic. And as the death count continued to rise, America is not prepared and nurses are not being protected. Many were uncertain about the future. It can turn out to be a really serious problem. Then came May 25th, 2020. The video seen around the world. I can't breathe. The day former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin kneeled on George Floyd's neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds. The killing of Floyd sparked nationwide protests. Just seeing everything that happened from Judge Floyd has made me more cognizant of like all the problems that exist. And I think I've been, I become an activist. I'm always, always, always fighting for like black people. No, but these protests were different. George Floyd, because of you, we've come together. It wasn't just black people marching, it's multiracial. It was young and old, it's families. And when the Chauvin verdict was announced... Just to count one, guilty. Count two, guilty. Count three, find the defendant guilty. The nation breathed a sigh of relief. We were finally turning a corner. Or were we? A large group of demonstrators gathered to protest the fatal shooting of 20-year-old Dante Wright. It is group is marching, calling for change. A 42-year-old was shot and killed by deputies. If the events of this year have taught us anything, it's that people of color experience America differently. No one can tell me that if had been a group of Black Lives Matter protesting yesterday, they wouldn't have been treated very, very differently than the mob of thugs that stormed the Capitol. And that our success as a nation lies in that truth. Not in fiction. Time for people to start correcting some of the mistakes of the past that are still rippling through present day. This past year, the concept of freedom has been tested, even redefined over and over again. With it, an entire movement was born and a conversation on race was sparked that I haven't seen in this country since probably the 1960s. Now, as we commemorate and even celebrate Juneteenth, we'd be remiss to not look back at the past year 
and how it informs how we think about freedom in this country today. Joining us now are civil rights activist DeRay McKesson, Daily Show producer and author of How to Be Black, Baratunde Thurston, and of course the Emmy-nominated director and producer behind the new Peacock documentary, Civil War, or do we think or who do we think we are, Rachel Boynton. Welcome all of you to the show. Nice to see everyone. Good to be here. Yeah. Um, uh, Dre, I'm going to start with you. Uh, we were talking probably, it felt a month ago, but uh, these COVID days seem weird, and so a month can sometimes feel like six months. How do you think about this past year? And I realize in asking you that, I'm asking a big question um, of which people will spend a lot of time on, but what are your biggest takeaways or two as you look back at what really I do think will end up being a tipping point year. Yeah, so I think a lot of people woke up. I think that people sort of understood the problem even more than they did in 2014 and 2015. I think that there were a lot of people who were like, oh, you know, I think this only happens in Ferguson or in Baltimore, Chicago. And then they realized, no, this actually is happening all across the country, especially with regard to police violence. I think that all of us being home gave more people sort of an opportunity to, to tap in and to participate. On the flip side, you know, the outcomes haven't changed. So the police killed more people in 2020 than every single year of data we have, except for 2018. It was not a win. The police are on track to kill at the same rate as they have uh, for the past decade almost. So, you know, in terms of the numbers changing, I think substantively there's been more symbolic change and structural change. And that's always what I worry about in these moments, that for all of the awareness, uh, we don't often see it turn into deep structural change. Interesting. So overall, would you say that you are optimistic that there will be, you called it structural change, structural, meaningful, substantial, persistent change? Or would you say that you are less optimistic than you are optimistic about the next five, oh. 10, 20 years? I'm always hopeful. You know, I think that there are I think that there are smart legislators across the country, especially at the local and state level, who are ready, who want to do the work. They're incredible organizers. So I think that uh, we can win this in this lifetime. I believe that's true. I am also mindful that the police, you know, there's not a period of time in the past where the police had less power than they do today. The police are incredibly powerful. They have remained powerful over time and they've only gotten more power over time. So if if we do not win, it'll only be because we were out organized. We are definitely right in this moment. And the question for us is, can we build a critical mass? Can we build a critical mass of people ready to do the structural work? I want to believe we can. Rachel, what are you, um, Rachel, first of all, where are you today? Where are you, where are you based as we speak? I'm in Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn, New York. So, so what do you, how do you think about the last year? What is your biggest takeaway or two? And again, as I said to DeRay, I realize that is such a big question to try and put in a confined box. But if you were to give, do your best shot, what would your biggest takeaways from the last year be? You know, I've, I've actually been thinking a lot about Juneteenth because of the holiday coming up. And I've been thinking a lot about the fact that there has been this enormous change you know, if only symbolic, it, yeah. not only symbolic, that we are going to be as a nation celebrating Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm worried about, as DeRay says, this, this, the essence getting changed. Mm -hmm. The fact that we're having these conversations today about critical race theory, that there is still questioning about whether or not we should be teaching children in classrooms the reality of our history. I worry about these things, and I, I, I don't want us to be satisfied with um, symbolic change. I think we need to be asking ourselves, you know, white Americans in particular need to be asking themselves real questions about the shape of their lives and what they can do personally to change things and how they can be active politically to get their, their politicians and their representatives to represent change. Rachel, how much conversation are you seeing among white friends, relatives, neighbors, what have you, about race at this point, knowing that there was a lot? I mean, What's to be that? perfectly honest, I, yeah. I live in a very white neighborhood that's an old Italian neighborhood. And, uh, you know, over the course of making my film, I actually pulled my daughter out of the local public school and put her in a different school because I... I started feeling really self-conscious about the fact that I was sending my child to an all-white school on the corner. Um, I think people, white people in general, are very uncomfortable talking about race. Um, I think of most people, I, I mean, I can't speak for all people, I can't speak for all white people, but the people I know in general are uncomfortable talking about race unless they do it all the time. And it's not, it, it makes white people in particular very nervous to have conversations about, about race in general, I think. 
Um, Baratunde, it's nice to see you. I feel like it's been a full decade, and I still have the picture. I, I got the proof. I have the receipts of us together almost a decade ago, not far from where Rachel is. I think we were in uh, Brooklyn or nearby, but, uh, uh, but it's nice to see you. Um, how do you hear what uh, Rachel and DeRay are saying, and how do you think about the last uh, year? Do you come out of that optimistic that uh, DeRay called it structural change uh, is, you know, is likely, or you leave it worried, or, or where are you? All the above, Carlos, and it is good to see you. Couple of fact checks. Yeah. Uh, we met up at a Starbucks on Spring Street, uh, <laughs> just around the corner from The Onion, where I was employed at America's <laughs> finest news source long ago and yeah. far away. Yeah. Uh, also, another update, I'm no longer a producer at The Daily Show. I am executive producer and host of my own podcast, How to Citizen. That's a probably more relevant uh, intro for the folks who don't know me who are watching right now. How y'all doing in your bathrooms and whatnot out there in the world? As far as what's changed, what I've learned over the past year, I've learned that many more white people have my cell phone number than I ever knew uh, because I got a lot of text messages, you know, especially uh, in the early part of a year ago, people expressing condolences and sadnesses, but also seeking tangible solutions to their inner angst about race so they can hurry up solve the racial justice crisis and get back to planning for Coachella next year. Um, I have felt that 2020 was everything, is overwhelming. It was the most intense, compressed range of emotions I've ever experienced in my life. Absolute exhaustion, fatigue, burnout, rage, impatience, incredulity, mixed with hope and optimism and surprise all at the same time. And the most powerful nation in the world fumbling, leading to the deaths, preventable deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. I didn't see that coming, but I wasn't exactly shocked either. Seeing the protests and the multiracial coalitions out in the streets, that was beautiful. But without an honest reflection on the other protests we saw also in the summer of 2020 to reopen hair salons at the butt of a gun, pointed at a state trooper at a state house in this nation, spitting COVID into the faces of the blue lives who allegedly matter. And the non-response to that leading directly to January 6, 2021. When you give people permission to act so foolishly, they will do it again. So we rolled out the red carpet for insurrection, as far as I can tell. So I'm moved by the depths of inner questioning that I have seen from so many people who were satisfied with doing that very much. Uh, but I am also clear eyed about the obstacles that stand in our way in the form of an entire political party, half of our political establishment, which aligns itself with undemocracy, with political violence, and with insurrection right now. And it's so afraid of the truth of this country, they're not brave enough to love it and tell the truth about it. Um uh, Rachel, I want to um, uh, piggyback on what Baratunde said and ask you, what brought you to do the documentary that you did? And, and, and give us a little bit of color on that, because I think it ties into some of the things that Baratunde was bringing up. Oh, I, uh, I started thinking about the film in July of 2015, after the Charleston Massacre. And I listened to a radio show that was talking about educational standards in the state of Texas. And it introduced me to something that I hadn't known, which is that there's a whole part of this country that doesn't believe that the Civil War was caused by slavery, that really doesn't believe it. Um, and I didn't, I didn't know that. I had never lived in the South. And when I heard that, I thought to myself, wait a second, like, if we're not telling ourselves the same story about who we are, how in the world are we ever going to get together as a country? And my job as a documentary filmmaker, I think one of the powerful things that documentaries can do is they give us a time capsule. They take a picture of who we are in a particular moment so that 20 years from now, we can look back at who we were and go, oh my God, right? It's a, it's a way of preserving, preserving the reality of us. And so that's what I was trying to do with the film. I was trying to really take a picture of the, the variety of who we are right now and and where we stand in terms of who gets to tell our story. Duray, what if anything surprised you in the last year? I hear 
Rachel saying that she learned a lot that surprised her in terms of how people saw the Civil War and from that might see our history more broadly. What, if anything, Dureg, knowing that you've been in uh, the larger movement, not for six months or a year, but for years now, did anything in the last year truly surprise you, good or bad? Uh, I think I was surprised at how much people forgot from the last protest, you know? Like, I'm, you know, what happens is that the protests come, everything feels like it can change, it's like we can do everything, da da da, and then that window closes and it closes and it closes. Eventually, it gets to a point where now where it's like the summer of crime, homicides, but like the window will close. So I think it was it was odd to watch people act like the window was just going to stay like the window was going to close. Either the news cycle was going to move on or like the window closes at some point. And I and people there was something about last summer that made people feel like it was an endless window. And like it's not right. I think the second thing is that. I've been on panels where people say things like the police have never been weaker today than they are before. I'm like, what police are you talking about? I'm in a lot of legislative rooms. The police aren't loud. They're not on the news being intense, but they are the same police. They're in all of the legislative rooms. They're talking to everybody who has power. They're just not doing it on TV because they don't have to. I think in a positive way, you know, there were a lot of people who I remember did not hang with us and we were in the street in Ferguson. They did not stand in the street in Baltimore or McKinney or any other place where the police had killed somebody. And when 2020 came around, they were like, I won't be silent again. So there were a lot of people who really did. They were like, history is not going to pass me up again this time. I'm going to go do the thing, stand in the street, make the call. And they did it. And like, that was actually, you know, I heard people say that in 14 or 15. I didn't know if they'd actually do it the next time there was an opportunity. I did not think the opportunity would come so soon. I'm like, whoo, I done lived through two big protests and I'm not old, you know, uh, but, but that was surprising. Um, Baratune, talk, talk to me a little bit about your circle. Do you find that you've got people in your circle who, um, frankly, might have been part of the January 6th crowd, or who, even if they weren't part of the uh, January... <laughs> or, or even if they weren't part of the I January... I curate my circle, bro. <laughs> right. It's so, a so, no so, insurrection zone. I'm sorry. No, a no insur- yes, that was good. I'll give uh, that to you, Baratune. <laughs> so, so, so Baratune, have, have you found yourself, though, in conversation with people who, um, frankly, are in a very different place on these questions of racial justice and racial progress? And if so, what, if anything, have you taken from those conversations? Um, and, and I say that really openly, not knowing whether or not you've had that opportunity or created that opportunity over the last year. That's a dope question. Thank you. This is why this is the Carlos Watson Show. <laughs> um, I have had the opportunity to engage with people who live in a different reality. Uh, I've I've been called upon to speak to a lot of groups of folks and translate and hug and berate all at the same time. And they've included a lot of student groups. And I will never forget uh, addressing a group of students in Arkansas. And one of them was uh, talking about her uncle, who was a police officer. And she was just coming into her own awareness about all the stuff that's going on. She was feeling a set of peer pressure about being woke, but she didn't really know what that meant. She just knew it was probably the cool thing to do. She also felt that she needed to defend her family member who was just trying to take care of his family and do a job that he had wanted to do his whole life. And she didn't believe that he was an expletive of any kind, uh, that he had a racist bone in his body. We also have learned through genetic studies that bones themselves are not racist, but rather the policies that those bones grow up in are and can affect our behavior. And I think it was humbling for me to um, try to empathize with folks who consume a very different information diet than I do. People who have been hoodwinked and shook and bamboozled to some degree people who have willingly signed up for that in some cases, but who are just getting a bunch of lies as a part of their regular media diet. And I also think that there's been, uh, you know, I get asked about the cancel culture thing a ton, and I talk to a lot of kids about it. And I think there's an interesting weaponization of the idea of accountability that has found purchase in right-wing media, where it becomes this freedom of speech argument. It's a First Amendment pro-America argument. And for those of us who have believed in second chances and restorative justice and redemption, 
it's an odd thing to be placed in a bucket where we don't give anybody second chances or where we judge someone by their worst or only mistake that we know of. And so there's an opportunity to build a mild bridge there and say, well, I'm not for that either. Obviously, I believe in second chances for everybody, whether you're incarcerated for theft or murder or you said some foolishness on social media. Uh, and I don't believe all cops are expletives, but I believe the system of policing is expletived. And uh, yeah, I don't have insurrectionists in my direct circle, and I have not met anyone who rolled up on the U.S. Capitol with bloodlust in their eyes. I don't think I could handle that interaction, honestly. Big picture, Virginia, is you, and again, none of us know all the answers, but as best any of us can know at the moment, as we go forward, knowing, as you said, that Arkansas experience you had, um, do you think the right way to make progress is one that involves lots of effort around collaboration? Or is it, despite the fact that we all may want collaboration, is it really focus on people who may be more progressive-minded and really getting them to take stronger, more courageous, more participatory stands? And, and I ask this because I've had this conversation with Deepak Chopra. I had this conversation with Reverend Sharpton. I have a conversation with a whole variety of people, which is, not in a starry-eyed way, but in a clear-eyed way, how do we get to a better place? Is, is it trying to build the bridges, be collaborative, or is there a risk that that could be a distraction and really part of what you saw in Georgia, a real focus on turning out um, uh, a, a healthier, and more vibrant set of progressive-minded people? Is that a better approach to trying to get to a new place? I believe we have a storytelling opportunity to paint a picture of the future we want that isn't just about what we don't want. I think we can talk about the fruits of racial justice and equality, gender equality, all kinds of equality and how much benefit that could bring to all of us. Heather McGee has done an excellent job of this in her recent book, The Sum of Us. It's a pro-justice argument, not an anti-injustice argument. And I think that can recruit some people off the sidelines who are a little confused or just overwhelmed or too busy because of this garbage economy we have to focus too much on such matters. But I will not promote wasting time on the likes of a Mitch McConnell, for example. Game recognize game and power recognize power. And a lot of people will bend to the power that is. We saw that with the Republican Party. They never would have said we are a Trump party until they became one because that's where the power was. And I think we need to define a center in this country that is progressive and positive and inclusive, and most of the country will move in that direction. We never had everybody, Carlos, yeah. never. Yeah. Not during Reconstruction, not during the First or Second World War. We had people who didn't want that. We had Nazi rallies in America that were pro-Hitler. Yeah. And we like to tell this story that everybody was against Hitler. We were not. Yeah. But what Joe Biden said in his inauguration speech rings in my heart and in my head when he talked about unity as a non-naive concept. It doesn't mean we all agree all the time. It means we had enough of us come together to move all of us forward. Yeah. So yeah. we just need enough. Yeah. We're never going to get everybody, but we can benefit everybody if we have enough on the right side. Yeah. And that certainly means turning out more of the people who are likely to agree. It means trying to avoid as many unforced errors as possible, but it also means not wasting time bending so hard to try to accommodate someone who's never going to come to you. They'll bend to the power that is. Let's be that power. Well, Rachel, in the, um, I'm going to give you the final word here. Um, has there been a person or two uh, over the last year who's caught your attention positively or negatively that you think says something about not only where we've been, but, but maybe what's possible going forward, whether it's been a political figure, a writer, a, um, an entertainer, an athlete, a nurse, a whomever. Is there someone who, who's, who's caught your attention? You know, I've, I, for my film, I talked with a lot of historians mm -hmm. and I really appreciated talking with people who know so much about the story of our past mm -hmm. and who can really connect what's happening today to things that have happened before. And um, David Blight is somebody who's in my film. He's a historian who I adore. And he wrote this wonderful book called Race and Reunion that I recommend everyone read. Um, he, he's written a lot of great books, but that's that's the one that I, I've reread like five times. But 
David um, has said some remarkable things to me and one of them has really stayed with me. Um, I asked him a question. I said, how are we going to have, how do you, what is the path toward a reunion? If we're gonna have a real reunion of this country, what's the path? And he said, you know, there are only two ways that this country has ever truly come together. One has been through great wars and one has been through a great depression. And even in COVID, we didn't manage to unite. Um, but he said, the only way that the country will ever truly come together is if we manage to make some kind of political coalition that where people can put their egos aside and find the two or three or four things that we can all agree on and work on those together. And I really believe that the answer here is in results. It's in results for the people who, as Baratunde said, might not be along for the ride, but getting them results, economic results, um, social results, healthcare results, education results, that can make a difference, right? And so to me, the key here is figuring out, get rid of mansion and figuring out a way to, to really make change, political change that will serve the majority of the country. That is the way forward. That is how you're gonna create a, a, a movement that people can get behind. It's not gonna be theoretical. It's not gonna be about convincing them. It's gonna be about doing something for them and showing them that this is, this is the way forward. Uh, Rachel, DeRay, Baratunde, thank you all. I appreciate all of you. Uh, Baratunde's got his dukes up. I love it. Eddie's got his mind sharp, Spring Street. All right, I'm going to make you take me somewhere good again next time I'm there. But, but thank you all. I really do so appreciate you, and I'm inspired by the time we're in. I know, it, um, as all of you said, there are a lot of mixed signals, but uh, for better or for worse, I, I, I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that there's more and there's better. So thank, thank you to all three of you for making time, especially on a Friday. I appreciate you doing it. Thank you, and an honor to serve on this panel with uh, you, DeRay, and you, Rachel. All right, Rachel. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you all. Thank you all. To continue our conversation, I recently sat down with Brian Lamb. He's the Chief Diversity Officer at J.P. Morgan Chase, here to share more about the company's work to drive sustainable change throughout their or through their Advancing Black Pathways initiative. Take a look. Hey, Brian. Carlos, great to see you. Thanks for having me. I love that you're joining me for this special, and it's really interesting when I think about where we are now. It's hard to believe it's been over a year since George Floyd's murder. When you think about the course of the last year, what are your big takeaways? I realize that's a big open-ended question, but it's a big open-ended time. So what are your big takeaways when you, yeah. when you reflect back? I agree, Carlos. Look, it's a, I know it's a, it, it may be a tough question, but it's the right question. We all personally and professionally have tried to reflect in some way over the last 12 months, make our own observations more than ever. As I reflect, you lay that next to a social and racial awakening that we saw live on TV. And we all kind of reacted to that differently. But in many ways, we all re reacted with fear, with frustration, in some kind, some cases, anger. And you fast forward a year, I think we still, in some cases, are processing that. As a leader and as a father, a son, a brother, a husband, there's other steps that I know I've tried to take to make sure that we don't miss a moment. And we don't allow that this moment to get away from us without learning and being a better version of ourselves as leaders, as human beings, as companies, and ultimately all having an insatiable appetite to create equitable opportunities for others. Talk to me a little bit about, about you and, and your thoughts on it in this moment. I'm kind of self-reflecting as well, and I'm kind of thinking about how has it hit me all that has transpired over the last 18 months. Where's the last year plus left you personally? As I reflect as a black man, it has hit me pretty hard, right, Carlos? I don't even think I was my best self. Mm -hmm in 2020. I was probably a lot more emotional than I typically typically am. And so I, I think that all weighs on us. And, and so, you know, we have to find that place to renew so that we can be our best selves as leaders. All of those things that make us who we are, uh, like this is a time to make sure that we don't miss the moment, but we find that opportunity to personally renew 
so that we're well positioned to move forward. What have you turned to over this last year, either to get through, to make some sense of it, to develop some ideas? What, what, what has fed you or sustained you or sparked you or provoked you over the last year? The connectivity with my, my, my loved ones, my family members. The other thing that was a bit of renewal for me was still public service. Hmm. I care immensely for youth and education. And I sit on a couple of boards around there. And it's funny, Carlos, going to help students and young adults really achieve their dreams and help them get excited and inspired about the future and know that this is just a moment in time that could frankly be a catalyst for the rest of their lives. Talk to me about Chase and give me something that you think you are doing well or you're doing better, because you know everyone who's watching this is going to be skeptical. What's something that you're either currently doing well or that you feel like you're genuinely on a path to doing well? Inside our firm, we want to focus first. Like, what could we be doing for our own employees? We have 250,000 employees around the world creating upskilling and upward mobility opportunities for our own employees, our own colleagues. I also think we have an opportunity around improved representation at higher levels in the organization. We've got very challenging goals and are going to hold our most senior level leaders accountable to demonstrating progress around representation at senior levels in the firm. And frankly, we're going to hold each other accountable to drive change there. At the end of the day, local execution matters. So as we make big $30 billion incremental commitments, that all sounds good at the really high level. But how does that show up in individual cities? We've talked about that publicly, the transparency and accountability of how we're showing up in local markets to deliver around our diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies. We're being very intentional around how our local management teams know what their roles are, what they're accountable for, that there's metrics and transparency around how we're showing up in those markets, and that we're working with local human rights groups, civil rights groups, consumer advocacy groups in those markets to make sure we're listening and learning to what they feel are the priorities. Talk to me a little bit about Juneteenth. Um, uh, Has that been something that you've commemorated over the years? In the firm. Last year, we started a fairly comprehensive approach to commemorating Juneteenth. We're building on that this year. We learned, right, a number of our leaders, our entire forum more broadly, became more proximate to the importance of Juneteenth, the history that really was the underpinning on why that is such an important day on the heels of two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Why was Juneteenth so important? Uh, particularly as it relates to slavery. Like all of those key elements of learning, we're not minimizing that. And we also not only think inside the firm, we have a responsibility to make sure people understand and are aware. Outside the firm, you're going to see us do a lot more to lean in, uh, to make sure that there is a good level of understanding on the role that Juneteenth has played in American history and what it should do to inspire permanent change around opportunities for everyone as a reminder of what can happen as we lose sight of creating equitable opportunities for others. The black community, particularly as it relates to slavery, there is a direct correlation to Juneteenth. There are also a lot of other very connected points as to why Juneteenth should serve as a reminder of what can happen as we lose sight of creating equitable opportunities for others. As you think about um, uh, uh, the next year in particular, what will tell you that we are on track and that J.P. Morgan in particular is on track when you talk about sustainability and equity? What will tell you, though, what will be your canary in the coal mine that will tell you that J.P. Morgan's on a good path a year from now? When we say diversity, equity, and inclusion, we can point to tangible actions and efforts that are measurable, that are sustainable, that are data-driven, and that ladder into the job to be done. Meaning what have the what has the community, the consumer, the business owner, the stakeholder told us is the gap around equitable opportunities. We look pretty hard, I would tell you, Carlos, at educational inequities. The purpose of standing up HBCUs in some cases over a hundred years ago, some more recent than that. There was a real reason. There was an inequity, a gap that was being filled. In some cases, that inequity is still there. You look at the achievement gaps of black students or Hispanic students relative to maybe their white counterparts? Is there an opportunity to close that achievement gap and see all thrive and grow? Another inequity is health. We talk a lot about the disparities in health. 
JP Morgan's thinking about how we lean in and do the right thing around health disparity. You heard us talk publicly about Morgan Health, which is a strategy that we're going to look at, which will include not just health disparities for diverse individuals, but more broadly, our entire employee population, because everyone deserves an opportunity to stay healthy. Another inequity, uh, and there's lots of data behind, is income and wealth. The income and wealth disparity is pretty wide. We point to real evidence of work that we're doing that's tangible and measurable on closing the racial wealth gap. That, that speaks a lot, Carlos, to our $30 billion racial equity commitment. Really get clear on what inequities that we felt like we could play a meaningful role, not just incremental, but more transformational. That's kind of how we thought about equity within J.P. Morgan Chase. And so a lot of our colleagues in the marketplace are starting to think through that same type of rationale. I think you're going to see more companies really trying to lean in and evidence the E in equity. Really appreciate it. We will, uh, we'll see you again. See you soon, buddy. My thanks to Brian Lamb and everyone at J.P. Morgan Chase who's committed to helping close the racial wealth gap. You can learn more about their work at www.jpmorganchase.com slash ABP. All right, on that note, let's hear a quick word from our friends at J.P. Morgan Chase. Take a quick look. In 2019, J.P. Morgan Chase launched Advancing Black Pathways to strengthen the economic foundation of black communities. Advancing Black Pathways is building on J.P. Morgan Chase's efforts to build a more inclusive economy for all. J.P. Morgan Chase is committed to helping close the racial wealth gap. I think progress for me looks like more non-black people having conversations about race and understanding that race is actually systemic. Progress looks like everybody, regardless of the state of the, the circumstances you're born into, has an opportunity to succeed. Because that will lift us all. Mr. President, Dr. Biden, Madam Vice President, Americans, and the world. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? After a year of uncertainty, America seems ready for a pathway forward. Today, we're announcing two expanded efforts targeted toward black wealth creation that will also help the entire community. Before the murder of George Floyd, many white Americans believed there were no racial barriers, that we were a post-racial nation. I don't see color. You don't, you don't see color. But now there's a growing recognition that despite electing the first black president, racism is still a huge problem that needs to be addressed. It's called systemic racism for a reason. There's 400 years of history here. And that's starting to happen. Confederate statues are coming down. Big corporations have pledged their support for Black Lives Matter. Police departments are making changes. A former police officer charged now with second degree manslaughter. Abusive officers are being charged and convicted. Guilty. And for the first time, two black women CEOs made the Fortune 500 list at the same time. I've said it before, I'm on the shoulders of giants. I hope that I can still be that person to make change happen. Now that's progress. We have some problems that we've not been able to solve, and we need some new soldiers with some new approaches, new solutions, and new energy. If you want to make the biggest impact in the world, then living with vision is the way to do it. I'm always going to fight for us. I'm always going to fight for my people and fight for what's right. If you're just joining us, welcome to a special live edition of The Carlos Watson Show. You're watching Journey to Juneteenth, and you just saw a powerful video package that we put together on the immediate path forward. Joining us now to continue where we left off, please welcome host and executive producer of the Emmy Award-winning CNN series, United Shades of America, W. Kamau Bell. Also joining us are actress and comedian Joelle Nicole Johnson, whose debut comedy album drops tomorrow on Juneteenth. Excited about that. And renowned poet, author, terrific staff writer for The Atlantic, Clint Smith. Welcome to all of you. Thank you all for joining me and joining me, especially on a Friday like this. Thank you one and all. Thank you for having me. Yeah. yeah. Um, Joelle, let me start with you first. Where, where do we go from here? Uh, you optimistic, you worried, combination. Uh, tell us what you see. 
I, I stay in all of the emotions. I stay in worry. I stay in optimism. I flow through them like the ocean. <laughs> so I think I'm optimistic because we're making progress. I mean, we had shows like Insecure in my industry. Um, you know, there's a show called Big Mouth where they replaced a white female actress who was playing a mixed race girl with a black actress. Shout out to Ayo Adabiri. And I uh, did The Tonight Show and I made Jimmy Fallon say Juneteenth. So I am very happy about progress, and I think we're making it very slowly, if not uh, sure. Uh, uh, Debbie Kamal Bell, Kamal Bell, fellow Bay Area uh, 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 person, how do you see where we are? Because, you know, you, both in your life but also in your work, you've traveled the country a lot over the last decade plus. You've seen nooks, crannies, big places, small places. Do you take all of that in the last year and say, and therefore – we've got sustainable good news ahead? And if so, what has to happen uh, to make you not look off to the left like that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I appreciate, first of all, I appreciate Joelle saying that she is, uh, it, it stays in all those places. Yeah. I, I'm sort of in a, uh, I think this half full glass got a little emptier is where I sit <laughs> right now. <laughs> Just the, you know, this, 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 the, declar the declaration of Juneteenth as a holiday on the surface is a great thing, but when you look at the George Floyd Act, the For the People Act, and the fact it clearly feels like to me that like the leaders of this country look at their to-do list and like we all do said, what's the easiest thing to do on this to-do list? Another holiday? Let's do that. And I think it's easy to get caught up in that, and I'm not no shade to Juneteenth, but I know as a black person, Juneteenth when I grew up, and I had a black mom, as we say, was not something we <laughs> talked about a lot. It was not something we, and I called her up last year, like, did you forget to tell me about Juneteenth? She's like, that was a Texas thing. And I think right now in all of the sort of the acclaim about the holiday, we actually aren't talking about the fact that for most black people, much like critical race theory, it wasn't something we were thinking about until about a, until very recently. Yeah. Uh, Clint, where are you uh, on this and, and on the larger question of where do we go from here because I hear Joelle saying that she lives in all those places, and I do too, on any given day or any given week. I think, given who my parents uh, are slash were, I, I want to be optimistic. I'm, I'm constantly like looking around the corner <laughs> for good news. D do you see good news up ahead? And if so, what are some of the ingredients that would make you not just hopeful, but probably somewhat confident that, that, that better days are ahead when it comes to fairness, racial inclusion, um, and, and other sorts of things that feel part of a better, more just fabric. Yeah, I mean, I think part of what I think about uh, when I think about Juneteenth uh, is the both endedness of it. I think that it is both this moment where we uh, mourn the fact that for more than two and a half years, uh, enslaved people in Texas were prevented from having what was rightfully theirs more than two months after the Civil War was effectively over. Uh, when General, Lee, Re, General Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox, um, which effectively ended the Civil War. And so we mourn what was, what was taken and kept from Black people while also celebrating the end of one of the most egregious institutions that has existed in, in our history. And so it's the sort of, I talk about it as the sort of marathon of cognitive dissonance that Black Americans live through all the time, in which we have this holiday, which I think to, to the previous point is, it is not in and of itself enough. But I also don't want to say that symbols don't matter, right? Because symbols and narratives uh, and stories uh, shape the, the ecosystem of ideas. And, and those narratives shape public policy and public policy shapes the material conditions of people's lives, which isn't to say that Juneteenth is going to erase the racial wealth gap, but it is a part of uh, a sort of shift in public consciousness, uh, hopefully, that, that can change the way that more folks are understanding our proximity to this period of history. I tell people all the time that the woman who opened the National Museum of African American History and Culture in 2016 alongside the Obama family was the daughter of an enslaved person, not the granddaughter or the great granddaughter. She was the daughter of someone born into intergenerational chattel slavery. So we talk about slavery like it was this thing that happened in the Jurassic age, like it was the Flintstones, the dinosaurs and slavery. But in the scope of human history, this thing was just yesterday. Uh, and, and I think that the more we can help folks collectively recognize that this thing was not that long ago, the more we can identify uh, the way that that phenomenon continues to shape 
the contemporary landscape of inequality today and thus create a set of policy measures and interventions that allow us to more effectively make amends for what has happened. So that, that is where I am gaining my hope from, is a hope that our recognition that Juneteenth will serve as an entry point to help us recognize our proximity to this period of history so that we can more effectively understand what we need to do moving forward. Joel, I, I saw that something Clint said uh, had you moving uh, in a way that, that told me you wanted to jump in on that. Uh, uh, how do you hear what he shared and what and what Kamau uh, shared in terms of uh, where we could go from here? I mean, I think it could be a positive thing, but my feelers are always up, okay? So if we're talking about give him a holiday, I completely agree with Kamau where the laundry list <laughs> above Juneteenth being a holiday, I mean, I can go 10 things off the dome that we could do more, voting rights being the first one that I would rather have than Juneteenth be a holiday. Sure, let's give people a day off, but I do think it's lip service and sometimes it seems like gaslighting. Like, what did you guys not want to do that you gave us the holiday? <laughs> so I, I stay just kind of, you know, on edge, if you will, <laughs> trying to book a plane ticket out to Amsterdam any second. <laughs> all right, what, if anything, Joelle, has surprised you in this last year? And maybe you will say uh, uh, not much because, as you said, you, you know, all of us are sophisticated enough to have thought about a lot of these things, to have lived with a lot of these things, to have had family, Clint, as you were saying, and not distant family, who has uh, lived through all this. But but as, did anything surprise you over this last year, Joelle? Yeah, Mackenzie Scott divorcing Jeff Bezos and giving all her money to people of color. That, <laughs> that came out of left field. Um, people want to talk about who our allies are. Mackenzie is an ally through and through. And I also don't know what her and Jeff was talking about for all them years. <laughs> For her to say, this is what I'm doing with your money. <laughs> you, you know what? That's so funny that you say that because I felt the same way when I saw her step forward. <laughs> I was like, somebody please get her a seat and some water yes. and make sure yes. she is good. I, I like all the HBCUs. Doing. Yes, yes. <laughs> and and not through some crazy, let's take forever and think about it for 12 years while lots of people aren't going to school, while lots of people aren't getting health care. Let's do some stuff. Now, not now, now, now. Um, uh, speaking of now, now, Cabal, <laughs> uh, what else should be on that list? You, you, you said it, and, and Joel um, uh, nicely reinforced your saying that, that if we were to think freshly about a smart, just to do list, while we would like to have Juneteenth on that, that there's power in that, Clint said that so well, what else, though, should be on? on the to-do list? What would make us a better, healthier, more perfect union? Oh man, I think I just uh, stop, de stop allowing the right to feed us their talking points. I think this critical race theory debate that has happened over the past week or so, has been the right feeding us a talking point and us having to debate on their terms. When really the fact is what we need is an accurate telling of, of the history of this country. And that has nothing to do with critical race theory. And I'll let uh, Clint talk about the smarter reasons why that's true. <laughs> but I think the idea being that like, we have let them conflate teaching elementary and high school students the accurate history of this country with something that generally apparently only happens in law schools and with ethnic studies majors. So, I mean, I think that we have to really figure out a way to navigate the mis the train of misinformation that the right is just going to keep pumping out for us. This is the war on Christmas. It's the art. It's defund the police. It's all these things that we keep allowing them to set the terms of the debate. And we have to figure out ways around that because that's how we get to the true glory is not being distracted by things like that. Oh my, you all of a sudden, you made me start hearing your boy, John Legend singing glory. Okay. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> we're, we're, um, we're compared a lot. That's not the first time we've been compared. <laughs> That's right when Joel starts moving the globe again. I love <laughs> Joel when you did that. That was uh, too good to be true. That, that uh, You can't pay for that. Um, Clint, talk to me, pick up on where Joel was talking about allies. Because I do think that's an interesting question of who are, not, who are leaders, who are... Uh, um, key pivot people who are potential allies. If you were to try to identify three or four people you would either like to see play a larger role or you think we should keep our eye on because they could be a part of whatever this next leg of the journey is. Who's on that list for you? Who are you thinking about in addition to Joelle's friend and neighbor, Mackenzie Scott? 
Yeah, I, I, I just tend not to think about it in interpersonal ways, right? I just tend to think about these in, in this in a structural or systemic way. So what I'd like to see, uh, and I think what many of our fears is, is that Juneteenth will be co-opted and used as a corporate performance by institutions who in their actual policies as corporations do things that are harmful to the very communities that they are purporting to uh, work in service of on, on Juneteenth. And so what I, what I want, when, and I think what a, what a meaningful Juneteenth commitment looks like is for some of these companies that are putting out these statements to actually interrogate their own practices. I should do some sort of self-reflection and interrogation of the extent to which uh, I am not uh, engaging in, in values and principles that are commensurate with those of Juneteenth. Could Juneteenth, and you talk about the meaning of Juneteenth, is there an opportunity for Juneteenth to be a time every year in which you do do a deep look at the quality of justice and the quality of work that each major organization does? And is that an interesting opportunity for organizations themselves, should they choose to do that, or an external group to kind of say, great, let's understand where we all are. If Juneteenth is a symbol of a desire for a more just space and a more just society, let's use Juneteenth not only as a holiday, but as an opportunity for introspection. I think it could end up being really powerful. And we obviously have lots of examples of that in U.S. and in world history of using a moment to, to more systemically evaluate where we are versus a, a set of principles. I think that could be interesting. Um, Kamau, talk to me about, about, you know, as I think about Reconstruction um, uh, after the Civil War, um, number of, of, of seemingly at the time positive and interesting things were happening for formerly enslaved people, elections to Congress, businesses built, uh, the beginning of, of schools, etc. Sadly, a whole variety of reasons didn't sustain shorter than I think that was, was called the Ku Klux Klan, I think is one of those varieties. Ku Klux Klan is the technical term, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, talk to me about the next decade or two. What would make my friend Kamal Bell look back and say, hey, Carlos, you know what? I was unsure. I was like my girl, Joelle. I was living in all of it at once. But doggone it, we, t we turned the corner, or it looks like we've turned the corner, and we've got some meaningful, structural, sustainable change. What would be true a decade from now if all of us were together? What would be allowing you to say, you know what, we actually have gotten somewhere meaningful, somewhere valuable. So obviously there's any number of things I could mention as again, that laundry list that jo Joyelle was referring to keeps getting longer and longer in our heads as we sit here. Right. But literally before I just came out today, before we I came out, before I fired up my computer to talk to y'all today, <laughs> I got a DM from an activist in uh, Chicago, Kofi Adamola, who was on United States of America three years ago talking about what Chicago needed to do to address structural racism. And I got a DM from him like, y'all need to come back because nothing has changed. And in that episode, we had many uh, black activists, ex-gang members, current gang members who were all unified about what about how the city needed to invest in the South Side and the West Side of Chicago and black neighborhoods, create more economic opportunity, and that that would lead to crime going down. And they everybody had the university. That was basically everybody's answer. And the South Side and the West Side of Chicago they look very much the same, and the ways they look different is through gentrification, not through reinvestment in the communities of people who live there. If in 10 years, Kofi can't send me that DM because the South Side of Chicago is a place that Black people are still welcome and is economically developed, and anybody who's been to the South Side of Chicago, you can walk blocks without seeing a business or a help wanted sign, and this was before the pandemic. So if in 10 years, Kofi's like, no, nah, things are different here and they're good for Black people. This is about putting money on the table for people and investing in the Black community. Joel, do the same thing for me quickly, if you don't mind. I apologize that I'm rushing us here at the end. And Clint, I'm going to finish with you. But Joel, what will be true a decade from now uh, when Kamal's paying for all of our dinner? Uh, Kamal, I put it on you. <laughs> uh, what, what's going to be true a decade from now that's going to allow us to say nothing's easy in this life? But, but, but we do feel like we're on a definitively better path. What would be true if we were together? In Women's reproductive rights will have been sustained. Um, it's, very va it's very possible that Roe versus Wade might get reversed. And if that happens, I will say the country is going in the wrong direction. So that's when I'm going to book my plane ticket to Ghana because 
we can't do that. So I need women's reproductive rights to be sustained in this country. Nice, nice. Clint, you get the final word here. What are you adding to that tapestry uh, a decade from now? Uh, Kamal, Joel, you, myself, we're together. What is true that has you saying, as tough as it was, as uncertain as it was, we used the last decade well and we're on a good path going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think Kamal alluded to this, but, but part of it is a profound reinvestment in communities and a recognition that, you know, as sociologists like Patrick Sharkey at Princeton University have written about this, how police aren't the only mechanism by which you can reduce violence. The, in, you know, in, in many ways, we know through sociological studies that police don't reduce violence in many contexts, but, but investing in YMCAs, investing in boys and girls clubs, investing in local churches, investing in, there's so many institutions that are already embedded in communities who do the sort of unsexy on the ground work with young people every single day. And sociologists have proven that the more you invest in those organizations, the more you invest in the social infrastructure of these communities, the more you make it so that young people don't feel like they have a limited set of options and, and that they are saturated in environments of desperation in order to, to protect their bodies. Because so many of the decisions young people make uh, that manifest themselves in violence are grounded in fear and grounded in desperation. And if we can reduce the context in which that fear and desperation is so saturated in their lives, um, then I think that we're going to find ourselves uh, investing in the mechanisms by which communities can uplift themselves uh, at, and, and not having to put millions of people um, in a sort of entangled merry-go-round relationship with the carceral state, um, you know, for, for decades and decades and decades. Clint Smith, uh, Kamal Bell, Joelle Nicole Johnson, whose uh, wonderful debut comes out tomorrow, so everybody go get it. Do not miss it. Uh, it's behind into her rights, so do not miss it. Uh, thank you all. Very grateful to you. I'm very grateful not just for you being here, but for you, even for someone like me who thinks about these things. Uh, I walk away stimulated. I walk away with new ideas, and I walk away with an even uh, more vibrant and robust sense of what, of what could happen. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. And, uh, and I wish you well. Thank you. Thank, thanks to all of you. And I will pick Thank up the you. check, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to eat twice then that day. All right, good enough. All right, listen, um, uh, uh, thanks to everyone. Uh, in just a minute, I'm going to welcome a very special guest to the show. But first, here's a quick word from our good friends at Chevrolet. It's still the night shift, just brighter. Still a night out? but everything fits in. Chevrolet, making life's journey just better. This has truly been an incredible show and a journey to Juneteenth. I'm so thankful for all the thoughtful conversations and contributions from our guests today as we've explored not only the history of the holiday where we've kind of look back, but also looking back at this past year and also thinking about where we could go from here. But the conversation's not over quite yet. Here to help me reflect on the show as a whole and discuss how we might go about resetting not just how we look at our brand new national holiday, but also America itself is highly acclaimed BBC anchor and journalist who I, I'm really pleased to say is uh, calling Ozzy her new home. Caddy K and I have worked together over the last year on a wonderful podcast and radio series called When Caddy Met Carlos, and uh, recently also joined us um, on Ozzy Fest, where uh, she moderated a number of interesting conversations with Fareed Zakaria and uh, Reverend Al Sharpton and uh, Mayor uh, Carmen Yuleen Cruz. And now uh, Caddy will be hosting a new show at Ozzy, as well as uh, helping us think about some of these important issues in terms of resetting. Uh, where we go from here. So I'm pleased to welcome uh, my good friend and my new colleague, uh, Caddy Kay. Um, Caddy, we have seemed to somehow turn you upside down. <laughs> oh. My whole world upside down, Carlos. Hold on a second. Yeah. Let's see. What do they want me to do? I think they're, they're turning around just, just a bit. You know, as we uh, wait for that turnaround to happen, you know, one of the most interesting things, I think, in the conversation that I just heard uh, was what Clint Smith mentioned uh, from The Atlantic, that notion that 
uh, former President Bush, Bush 41, said. He called it uh, bright, shining lights, um, uh, points of light. And I do wonder what would happen if 20 or 30 of our most important uh, centers in the country, if we really vibrantly reimagined them and got them to a much stronger place, places like Chicago and Baltimore, uh, places like my hometown of Miami, uh, or Los Angeles as well, if a real priority was made uh, to show that substantial change, economic change, uh, justice change, healthcare change, and that those became really healthy centers, uh, what would be true? It actually excited me as I heard Clint talk about it because it felt very possible. It felt like not just a large amorphous undertaking, but really an opportunity to choose a dozen or two dozen places and really make them models of, of what could be. Um, Caddy, it looks like we have uh, turned you right side up. It's nice to see you. It's good to see you the right right way up too, Carlos. <laughs> I was getting I was getting vertigo there. I know I'm the other the other side of the continent, but not quite in Australia. No, not quite in Australia. So we we've got you in the right way. Um, Caddy, um, um, how much of the conversation were you able to hear, and what if what if anything struck you most uh, from the conversations from today? Look, so I think you know constantly there's the question, and and you phrased it well, and the guest just now phrased it really well. Uh, Carlos, between optimism and a feeling that we haven't got far enough, right? Mm -hmm. And that I have had that same feeling over the course of the last year, as Joelle was just talking about, that there is so much that seems positive. It's, it's very tempting to see the glass half full. We now have Juneteenth. There has been much more engagement from white people in this discussion. It's one of the things that Reverend Al Sharpton has always spoken about, the fact that this is different because there's been engagement from white people on a, in a way that there hasn't really been very much before. And yet there is still, still clearly so much more to do. And I thought the comments we were just hearing now about tangible progress in communities um, and ways that we might be able to measure that. I thought what you said, Carlos, about maybe using Juneteenth as a way almost to, to collect the data, right? To, yes. to measure where we are. I really like that idea. Magazines have been doing this for a while, monitoring which companies are the best ones to work at for parents, for example, or for mothers. Maybe we need to just extend that and have very public data on how companies are performing at the C-suite level, at the board level. Um, I'm increasingly a fan of quotas and making it much more open. And I, th I think maybe this is the day, right? This is the day we could have some conversation about that on an annual ongoing basis. You, you know what would be interesting about that? I mean, we certainly see it in corporations with earnings reports, right? Kind of annual earnings reports. And, you know, as a, you know, shareholders hold CEOs and companies to account for financial performance and for plans going forward. And it could be a really interesting thing. And again, not just private organizations, but even uh, important public organizations, right? How well are our hospitals doing? How well is our right. education system doing? How do we think about, you know, I've had very interesting conversations with the former police chief in Houston, Art Acevedo, who's uh, head of the uh, uh, major and mid-level uh, police association. So all of the police chiefs in uh, North America, you know, roll up into uh, that organization. He's now in Miami. And he has said, we need to do a better job of the public data and of the accountability, and it'll make us be better. And it'll actually allow us to celebrate the best among us and the best work uh, among us. Um, Caddy, what have been some of the other ideas that you've either thought about on your own or some of the most interesting ideas that you've heard for how we can keep making progress? Because I, I do find no matter who I speak to, whether it is um, someone like the young conservative representative Madison Cawthorn of North Carolina or whether it's someone like the filmmaker Ava DuVernay, no one is sure that we have really made sustainable change. And so I do think that people are actively looking for ideas for progress. What are some of the ideas maybe that you've either thought about yourself or you've heard uh, that you think maybe we should try this over the next year or five? Yeah, and I, look, I agree too. And I had, that, I had a slight concern after the Derek Chauvin murder trial mm -hmm. that there had been so much focus particularly in the press, leading up to that trial and 24-7 coverage of it. And then what was going to happen after that? You, you know what it is like, Carlos, in our business, that sometimes a lot of resources, I mean, literally practical resources of a news organization can go into covering one particular moment. And then that moment is gone and the, the attention shifts. 
Right. It's a busy right. world. There's a pandemic going on. There's an election somewhere else. You know, the weather goes crazy out west. And attention, it's very hard to sustain um, press attention and public attention on that. So, uh, and whilst I don't think Juneteenth in and of itself changes the world, every opportunity that we can take to refocus the spotlight on this issue, I think we should. And for me, that's why this holiday is as important as any other reason, because it gives us a day every year, along with other days, when we have the conversation again, just like you've just done, right? You've just had an hour and a half conversation about this issue because of Juneteenth. If you didn't have Juneteenth, you might not have done this special today. So I think every time you can have a conversation about this and include as many voices as possible, and I think it's interesting what you said about um, the congressman, because he's not a natural ally in this conversation, but the more you can actually bring in other voices that are not natural allies, perhaps, into the conversation, I do think that helps make progress. I found this with my work on women. We get much further when men are in the room. It's great for me to go and talk to women's events. I enjoy it. They enjoy it, but I'm preaching to the choir. I feel we make much more progress when there are men and perhaps even men who are skeptical brought into the conversation. And I think the same is true on race. White people need to be part of this conversation. Conservative white people need to be part of this conversation. Because otherwise, without that, I don't think you're going to make as much progress as quickly as you'd like, to, as you we'd know, all I like to. You know, Kenny, I think that is such a powerful idea, and I think you're right. And I think that one of the interesting opportunities over the next year from this Juneteenth to the next is to actually have several dedicated conversations around that. And so as you and I continue to talk about some of the opportunities, I could see us uh, in a place like Oklahoma, or I could see us in a place mm -hmm. like West Virginia, as well as in places like Baltimore and yep. New York and Chicago, having those conversations and allowing uh, some brainstorming, some airing, some skepticism, some challenge, some debate, that there, that probably, as you said, a, a more participatory um, conversation might get us to to a different place and that could end up uh, that could end up being interesting. Um, Caddy, I know you uh, haven't been able to spend a lot of time outside of the US, but obviously your roots go deep around the world, uh, whether it's the UK, whether you've lived in the Middle East, you've lived in Africa, you spend time in Asia and other parts of the world. How much of the Juneteenth and racial uh, progress conversation have you uh, seen abroad? And, and has this conversation largely remained a U.S. one with a little bit of ripple effect? Or do you think that there's, you know, that there are robust conversations happening in Brazil and in the U.K. and elsewhere? I mean, Juneteenth in and of itself, not much conversation. People don't know the date particularly. I mean, to be honest, my kids went through D.C. public schools in very diverse schools. and. I don't remember hearing very much about Juneteenth as a date. And it was interesting to hear the previous conversation and hear that was the same too. That, so that day in particular, no, not so much. Huge amount of focus on what's happened in this country over the course of the last year um, and the killing of George Floyd. And that, as we all know, had massive ripple effects in terms of protest movements around the world in countries in every single content, continent. We saw protest movements. Has it been sustained in the way that it has here? I'm less convinced. And I do think the United States, and it was interesting, I was having a conversation with an executive in the UK recently who was talking about this in the media industry and was, and was very focused on it and was and very thoughtful about what was happening and how it translated to the UK experience. And she was saying, yeah, there's a lot more focus in the UK now on diversity in terms of people of color than there was beforehand. But it's a less fraught conversation, honestly, than it is here in the United States because of the legacy of slavery. And because, as we, as we were just hearing, it's not that long ago. Um, and so I just think that makes it a, it makes it a, a much more um, real and alive and in some ways raw conversation in America than people are having, certainly in the UK, and probably in, in most other countries as well. It's a more urgent conversation, Carlos, in America, because of what this country was founded on, because it, the wealth of the United States was founded on the back of slaves. It was true too, to some degree in Europe and in the UK, which was deeply involved in the slave trade and that's where it came from. 
but the conversation hasn't been as raw, I would say. And there's an urgency that comes from that rawness that I think is actually what gets us progress um, and an, a, a, an uncomfortableness that comes from that uh, from that rawness that I also think gets us progress. And I, I'm not I'm seeing less of that in other countries, right. but it doesn't surprise me given the history of this country. You know, Katty, as we wrap up, I'll tell you two other things as I hear you speak that I'm going to keep my eye on. One is what happens on college campuses this fall, because I think college campuses all around the globe from, you know, Eastern Europe in uh, 1968 to uh, Tiananmen Square to, you know, civil rights uh, protests here. College campuses have often been places that have kind of stirred change. And so I'll be intrigued to see once students are back on campus in a meaningful way, will they restart this conversation or take it in new directions? So I think that that will be one to watch that I'll be really intrigued on. And the other is I watched um, Vladimir Putin uh, following the summit with uh, President Biden. I saw him weigh in on the January 6th Capitol riots and the trials and the rest. And it really did make me wonder what would happen if another significant foreign leader were to weigh in on this question and really shine a light on it. And in this era of social media where they could really reach you know, tens of millions of Americans unfiltered, that also could allow someone to have a disproportionate impact on the speed and the intensity and the engagement around this conversation. I mean, imagine if Xi Jinping, or I know that um, Angela Merkel is stepping down soon, but, but imagine if she were to engage in this conversation. And again, race plays out in different ways in Germany as well. I think that'd be quite intriguing. So those are two of the things I think I'm going to keep my eye on over the next year between here and the next Juneteenth. Yeah, I mean, that would be fascinating. Right? I mean, I'm not sure that Vladimir Putin is doing it for the most honourable of intentions. <laughs> um, indeed, I'm not sure, indeed. having watched him in, <laughs> in Geneva. <laughs> has he ever done anything for the most honourable of intentions? <laughs> right, right, right. But it would be really interesting to hear what Angela Merkel or other leaders thought of what was happening here and then reflected on it in terms of their own countries too. I think that would be fascinating. Yeah. I would love to be a fly on the wall of those conversations. Yeah, yeah, it could certainly be very interesting. Um, Caddy, we will leave it there, but thank you so very much for uh, helping us uh, bring this to a close. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in person very soon. Good to see you, Carlo. Good to see you. All right, uh, I'm so glad that Caddy could join us. In fact, my heartfelt thanks, not just to Caddy, but to all of our wonderful guests and sponsors who made this show happen. As Caddy said, what a wonderful, unusual thing that we were able to have this conversation, that this conversation came in such a timely way with President Biden signing the bill into law and with so much opportunity uh, going forward. I hope this is the first of what will be many valuable such conversations. Uh, as we close out, special thanks to our sponsors, Procter & Gamble, J.P. Morgan Chase, Chevrolet. Big shout out. Thank you so very much for all the good work uh, that you're doing for the support here. If you want more of this good stuff, be sure to tune in to The Carlos Watson Show every weekday. We've got new episodes, all sorts of good people coming your way. And if you want to continue to help us uh, in this conversation, please get active online, share your own story, and be sure to use the hashtag Journey to Juneteenth. Uh, thanks again for watching. Have a truly wonderful Juneteenth. Be safe, be well. Good night. Hey, tune into The Carlos Watson Show. It's like no other. You're going to enjoy it every weekday on YouTube.